Good morning us today. Um, we've been blessed with the presence of uh, Dr. Adrian Peng, uh, who's going to discuss the little red dot amidst U.S.-China rivalry, great power competition from a Southeast Asia perspective, which speaks to the general shift in the strategic concerns of a number of actors from this conception of the broader Asia-Pacific to an even broader uh, Indo-Pacific uh, involving Australia, the United States, Japan, and India. Um, so Dr. Ang's at uh, Roger Rodman School of International Studies at Nanyang Technological U uh, University, and he's a former professor here at FIU in another life. And um, just thank you for uh, doing this presentation for us. Well, good morning. Thank you, Professor Liguri, for, for hosting me in, in, in your class today. Um, I also, also like to thank uh, SIPA for, for, for having me, um, the Asian Studies uh, for also sponsoring this, this talk. And before I begin, sort of just the usual disclaimer that right, this and all its fault are my own. It doesn't speak right, for uh, the S. Rajaratnam School of, of International Studies or uh, the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies uh, that I am affiliated with at RSIS. So today, what I actually wanted to, to speak to you about is right, sort of great power competition from a Southeast Asian perspective. And you know, since this is, is an IR theory class, sort of, uh, sort of lay out where we're going. Uh, so that there is sort of method to my madness, right? So what we'll do is, is right, sort of begin at the highest level of, of extra abstraction. And right? sort of to view US-China competition as structural or, right, or, or, or systemic, right? We can examine the reasons for uh, US-China rivalry during uh, Q&A, right? For, but for the purposes of, of right, my talk today, right? We'll take that as, as given, right? So, and then we're gonna move down to the regional level, right? To look at, at the region, right? And look at some of the various contested definitions of, of region, right? And then sort of down to the, the state level to look at it from uh, right, Singapore's perspective, the, the, the state level, and then down to the indivi individual level, right? Where I'll share with you some uh, data on, on public opinion uh, about US-China rivalry. And so, the U.S. and its allies, uh, China and ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, all offer competing visions of quote-unquote order, right, for the Asia-Pacific, right? And each of these powers, right, present right, what we call different versions of regional security architecture, right? So one way of thinking about security architecture is that it is a manifestation of global order, right? Meaning, right, architecture tells us about who is to be included in the region, right? What structures should this region have, right? And what functions and rules right, should this region have? Right? Um, right, before going any, any further, right, one of the things that we should understand is right, the very definition of region is contested. Right, so as, as, as IR theorists, right, and you're in you know, IR theory class, right, constructivists tell us that right, reality is socially constructed, constructed, right? Region, in this sense, is socially constructed. Region is geopolitically constructed. Right, so there is, even now, right, controversy about what do we call the region? Right, so before great power rivalry, before US-China great power rivalry, right, 
The region was broadly considered the Asia Pacific. Right? But even that term is political, right? Because it speak it spoke to you, right? a period right, in which the emphasis was on globalization, right, economic interdependence, connectivity, regional multilateralism. Right? But now, right, that framework Right, that understanding of, of, of Asia is being challenged. Right, and what the United States and its allies have done is to introduce right, the Indo-Pacific concept. Right, and this Indo-Pacific concept right, is not politically neutral. Right, it is not value-free. Right, it is political and value-laden. Right, so the idea of the Indo-Pacific comes to us right, originally from the Japanese. Right? It was uh, the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's government, right, who in, which in 2016 right, released its free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Right? So why did Japan come up with its FOIP, right, free, and Indo, free and open Indo-Pacific? Uh, it was in reaction to the rise of China. All right, so it is a reaction to a shift in the global balance of power. All right, and all that came with it. All right, more complex, more uncertainty. All right, it also reflected a increased importance of the region. Right, the Indo-Pacific. Right, to include India, right, and the need right, to bring in India right, as a counterweight to a rising China. Right, a third point was right, under the Japanese version of, of the free and Indo open Indo-Pacific was that this strategy would not challenge existing institutions in the region. It will not create new institutions right, to challenge existing institutions. All right, but all right, the point was, it was a recognition that no country alone, right, even the United States, right, as the world's sole superpower, right, could maintain or enhance the existing regional order, right? one that was based on the rule of law. Right? And Japan, for its part, would cooperate with what it called like-minded partners. Oops. Yeah. All right, so beginning with the Trump administration in, in 2017, Right, America begins to adopt right, a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Right? But right, one of the things that you should know is right, even when we look at America's allies in the region, right, and we'll, we'll speak to that soon, right, Japan, Australia, India, Right, each of them have still very different understandings of the region right, and what the strategy should be. Right, but generally, right, America's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy right, is still grounded in its bilateral alliances. Right? So what we often refer to as the hub and spoke system Right, or the San Francisco system, right, America's system of treaty allies. Japan, South Korea, Australia, the Philippines, and to a much lesser extent, Thailand. Right, so right, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy still privileges right, this hub and spoke system. But 
right, there is also a recognition that this is not enough. All right, and what it does is to add all right, what we often call minilateralism. All right, we, America doesn't want multilateralism because it is too cumbersome. And as we'll see with, with right, the experience of ASEAN, right, ASEAN multilateralism, right, they argue, has failed in dealing with an assertive China. All right, so instead, right, America is pushing for minilateralisms. And these minilateralisms take different forms. Right? So we have something called the Quad. Officially, it is the quadrilateral security dialogue right, between the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. Right? So again, right, if you look at these countries on, on, on a map, right, they form right, sort of the four points that frame the Indo-Pacific region. All right? And of course, officially, right, they will say right, the Quad is not directed against China. Right? But realistically, right, the Quad is right, directed at right, a rising and assertive China. Right? In addition to the Quad, we have something right, that is awkwardly called AUKUS. Right, which is right, the meshing together of right, Australia, the UK, and the US. Right? So this is a sort of tripartite agreement right, that has to do with, with military and, and technology, basically to get the Aussies right, sort of up to speed right, militarily right, in the face of, of again, right, this rising and assertive China, right? And finally, for, for the alphabet soup, right, we have something called IPEF, right? The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. So in 2017, right, after the Trump administration took office, one of the first things President Trump did was to pull the United States out of something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right, which was going to be Right, a free trade area covering the Asia Pacific. Right, so what happened then was right, the Asian countries decided even though the United States was no longer going to be part of this TPP, they were going to go ahead anyway. Right, so they created their own right, sort of version sans the United States, CPTPP, the Comprehensive Partnership for Pacific Trade and, and Freedom or something, but CPTPP. Right? So, all right, with the Biden administration back in, in, in office and right, America's domestic reality that free trade is a dirty word. Right? There, is, is, there is apparently no domestic political appetite for free trade. Right? So the Biden administration's solution is to come up right, with this IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Right? There are four different pillars right, to IPEF. Right? Countries in, in, in Asia can sign up to different um, pillars. Right? So far there are 14 uh, different partners. But the key takeaway is it is not a free trade agreement. Right? Market access for Asian countries is off the table. Right? Asian countries recognize this, right? And I think for many of them, right, IPEF is a way to keep America engaged in the region. I think everybody recognizes that it's not a very good deal, right? But something from the US is better than nothing, right? And, and this is to keep the US uh, engaged in the region, right? Finally, Right, so the, another part of, of FOIP is right, the emphasis on the rules-based order. Right? And here we're talking about right, one that is based on liberal democratic values. Right? Democracy, human rights. Right? And this is also something that, right, that we broadly see in right, the administration's 
strategy. Right? So in, in, in the last month, it's quite exciting. We've, we've seen the Biden administration release right, its long-delayed national security strategy. And in just last week, right, it also released its national defense strategy. Right? And one thing that right, the Biden administration has done is to broadly frame right, US-China competition as an ideological competition, right? one between democracies and autocracies. Right? But this is something that doesn't play very well in the region. Right? So again, right, once you, you get out of, of right, Japan, Australia, India, South Korea, Right. There aren't very many other partners that are full functioning democracies. Right? They are what we call anocracies, right? Countries that are right, in between imperfect democracies. Some of them are authoritarian regimes. Right? And America is going to have to engage right, with these countries if, if it's going to get anything done. Right? So that is, is the American vision. Right, China right, has its own vision of regional order. Right? Its community of common destiny, right, which was uh, released five years ago right, in, in the uh, 19th Party Congress by uh, President Xi Jinping. Right? So again, again, interesting things are, are happening. Right? Last week, we had the 20th Party Congress. Okay, and really what we see in, in the 20th Party Congress is again, right, a hardening of China's position. Right, again, right, China's vision of regional order is one that is, is grounded on the Asia Pacific, right, really arguably China centric, right, but one that seeks to marginalize the US when it comes to security matters. Right? One that views the United States as an outside power. Right? And from China's point of view, right, it wants to have or emphasize bilateralism. Right? So for, for, for ASEAN, right, the view is right, engagement is supposed to be Right, one plus ten, right. But more importantly, right, rather than engage ASEAN as an institution as a whole, right, China's preference is to engage ASEAN member states bilaterally. Right, and, and we'll we'll see. There's a reason for that. Right, the ability of China right to divide ASEAN, right comes from its emphasis on, on bilateralism. All right. If we sort of listen to right, the administration and, and the American point of view and, and right, again, the emphasis on, on right, the rules-based order, right, right, this produces a right, sort of very stark dichotomous view of, of, of the world. Right? So the, the framing is, is such that right, either we stick with the American rules-based order or the alternative is anarchy. Right? But things are a little more complicated than that. Right? So China's vision right, arguably right, emphasizes international law, but with a massive caveat. Right? So the caveat is, right, International law should recognize specific historical circumstances of individual countries. Right? And here in, in, in this case, right, China is talking about the South China Sea, right? which we will get to uh, shortly. All right, so in terms of, of China's vision right, for the region, right, China has repeatedly stated that it doesn't seek hegemony, right? but it is also one that opposes right, American hegemony. Right? It wants a greater say as a regional power, 
right? One that recognizes China's new status, right? And since COVID, right, we have seen China adopt, right, or employ aggressive wolf warrior diplomacy. Right. The third vision right, comes from ASEAN, right? the Association of, of Southeast Asian Nations. Right. So just a little brief backgrounder. Right? ASEAN was created in 1967. Right? So this is the height of the Cold War in Southeast Asia. Right? The Vietnam War is, is raging. Right? And five countries. Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand, right? The original five ASEAN member states, right? Found the Association of, of Southeast Asian Nations, right? Later in, in, in the 80s and, and 90s, and, uh, right? ASEAN will expand, right? To 10 members. But, right, ASEAN's purpose, right, or goal, right, in 1967 was, right, these countries had just basically, right, freed themselves from colonialism, right, they had just gained, most of them had just gained independence, right, and they were looking at the Cold War and basically wanted no part of great power, this superpower competition in the Cold War. Right. And so what ASEAN did was, right, sort of because it also had to take into account regional sensitivities, right, it created a system of governance right, that was consensus-based. Right. So right, decisions have to be by consensus. Right. There is a principle of, of non-interference in each state's domestic affairs. All right, so ASEAN is very risk averse. Right? ASEAN is, is really not known right, for, for making sort of right, bold or, or exciting gestures. Right? And it works by incrementalism. But right, ASEAN, right, especially in, in, in the post Cold War era, right, has built up Right, an impressive regional security architecture right, based on multilateralism. Right? So it, it has created different institutions, right? like the East Asia Summit. Right? Why is the East Asia Summit important? Right? It is important, the EAS is, is important because it is the only regional summit that includes all the major powers of the Asia Pacific, right? So US, China, Japan, Russia, and India, right? And, and just last week, right, the White House has said, right, President Biden will attend the East Asia Summit uh, later this month. Right, then we also have something called the ARF, right? Or the ASEAN Regional Forum, right? And this Right, is the premier multilateral forum on security issues in the Asia Pacific. Right, so it is again right, the only sort of pan regional organization for the region that includes right, a meeting of its foreign ministers. Right, and it is in keeping with right, sort of ASEAN's belief in maintaining open regionalism. Right, so the ARF has 27 members, right? T 10 ASEAN members, 17 of them are from outside the region. Right, then we have something called right, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, right, ADMM Plus, right, which is right, the multilateral forum for defense ministers for the region. Right? ASEAN Plus 3 helped bring together right, China, South Korea, and Japan. All right, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership all right, brings together ASEAN and its five free trade agreement partners. Um, what is that? Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea. Right? It is the world's largest FTA. 
All right, so RCEP encompasses 30% of global GDP, right, and about a third of the world's population. All right. But this vision of regional security, of, of regional security architecture, right, is premised on what is called ASEAN centrality. All right, so this is, is if, you, if you follow the, these developments, right, it is something that ASEAN is, is both proud of and extremely paranoid about. All right, so ASEAN central, centrality means that right, sort of ASEAN has to be in the driver's seat in all these developments. Right? That ASEAN should be right, the venue for consultation, for agreement, right? But what is happening, of course, is right, great power competition, right, different visions of the Indo-Pacific right, are challenging ASEAN centrality, right? AUKUS, the Quad, right? These right, are bypassing ASEAN, right? There is right, a belief in, in the region that the United States no longer views ASEAN as fit for purpose. I, I, I just spent a week in, in, in DC before coming to, to, to Miami, right, speaking to um, scholars from a whole bunch of, of American think tanks, and that is generally their view. Right? The American perception is ASEAN and all its fancy right, regional security architecture has not been able to handle or deal with the rise of China. Right? And its vision of uh, America and its allies' vision of, of the region is a reaction right, to that failure. Right? But nonetheless, Right. The ASEAN vision again, right, is 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 based on a rules-based community, right? The ASEAN way, right? Sort of non-interference in in the inter internal affairs of of other states, right? The peaceful resolution of disputes, right? A consultative decision-making process, right? One based on on consensus, right? And non-hegemonic leadership. Right. But all this was premised on relative peace in the region. Right? And one where the great powers were basically in a sort of rough balance with one another. Right? So when the great powers, when the superpowers engage in zero-sum competition, zero-sum conflict, right, as we see now, right, over Ukraine, right, the West and Russia, or in the region, right, great power competition between the US and China, ASEAN gets caught in the middle. Right? It is something that ASEAN was not designed to deal with. Right? So its, its decision-making processes right, were not designed to deal with these types of conflict. Right? ASEAN becomes divided. ASEAN becomes ineffective. Right? And in particular, right, these, right, I will caveat, there are four of these issues. Three are truly divisive, right? But the fourth, Taiwan, is of a different matter altogether, all right? So if we look at, at China and, and, and the South China Sea, right, this is about right, competing claims to the South China Sea, right? So the South China Sea is, 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 is a critical right, waterway where, right, almost more than one third right, of, of global trade and energy passes through that region. Right? It is subject to competing claims by China and, and various uh, ASEAN member states. 
right? China's right, infamous right, sort of nine-dash line basically lays claim right, to just about the entirety of, of the South China Sea. Right? And China has also militarized coral atolls right, in the region right? and, and is engaging in, in illegal fishing. Right, then we have right, sort of the coup in Myanmar, right, and, and uh, the inability of, of the organization right, to restore democracy. Right, some, that is something that, that America is deeply upset about. Then we also have Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, right, sort of that split the organization. So Singapore was 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 probably ahead of, of all the other regions in its reaction to uh, Russia's invasion of, of, the, of Ukraine, right, imposing economic sanctions on, on Russia. All right. Whereas some other ASEAN states were sort of more ambivalent. Right? So take for example, right, Vietnam. Vietnam has close defense relations with Russia, right? So Vietnam has been much more ambivalent, right, about condemning um, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, right? Sort of Cambodia has been uh, slightly more aggressive, right? Laos has basically backed Russia. So, right, different countries in, in the region, right, are dealing with, with, with the Ukraine war very differently, right? Why I caveated the fourth, right, the cross-strait tensions, right? We're talking about Taiwan here, all right? Taiwan doesn't so much divide ASEAN as it scares the bejesus out of the countries of the region, all right? So in, in August, right, when House Speaker Nancy Pelosi right, visited uh, Taiwan and China reacted Right, by essentially right, blockading Taiwan and, uh, and, and conducting military drills, right, ASEAN issued a statement about the straits. Right? It couldn't even bring itself right, to use the T word, Taiwan. Right? But right, there is right, this belief in the region that Taiwan is probably the one flashpoint right, in the Asia Pacific that can trigger general war in the region, right? And it is an issue, right? Unlike the South China Sea, unlike Myanmar, unlike the Ukraine war, it is an issue in which the countries of the region do not have any agency, right? On all the other three issues, Right, there is still room right, for ASEAN and ASEAN member states to maneuver. Right? But on Taiwan, right, they have no agency. Right? It is something that is out of their hands completely. Right, so what is Singapore to do? Right? Somebody actually told me I should have introduced Singapore with crazy rich Asians. Have you guys watched Crazy Rich Asians? Yeah. Right, so that is, that is one part of, of, of Singapore, right? Uh, but I just came from, from DC, so I, I thought it would be appropriate, right, to, to, to compare Singapore to DC. So the CIA World Factbook tells us that Singapore is three and a half times the size of Washington, DC. So not very big, right? It has about uh, six million people. Uh, it is multi-ethnic, uh, but people of, of ethnic Chinese descent make up about three quarters of, of, of the population. All right, then we have uh, Malays, Indians, Eurasians, and, and all right, a whole bunch of, of um, other ethnicities. All right, Singapore has an open economy that is highly dependent on, on exports. Right, so right, that fuels right, the crazy Asian rich lifestyle. Uh, right, but 
It is also located right, along strategic Southeast Asian sea routes. Right? So it is at the, the southern end of, of the M Malay Peninsula, right, along the Straits of, of, of Malacca. All right, so what is right, Singapore as, as the little red dot supposed to do right, when it comes to great power competition? Right? What do you do when you have five, six million people when right, your, your, your country is only three and a half times the size of, of, of DC? All right, so Singapore, like Many of, of the other ASEAN member states have realized that you could side with either of, of the superpowers, either US or China, right? And you could probably get short term benefits, but, right, you would increase your economic and political risks. All right, so what we and others have done right, is to try to search for a middle ground between the great powers. Right? So very often, right, you will hear, right, not just my prime minister, right, Lee Hsien Long, right, but other le le leaders of, of the region saying, don't make us choose. Right? We do not want to choose between right, China and, and, and the US. Right, so what we have done right, is, since the Cold War, right, is to pursue both China and the US to engage both right, in terms of economics and politics and diplomacy. Right, so again, right, in terms of IR theory, Right, it is neither a purely balancing nor bandwagoning strategy. Right? So if you recall your Ken Waltz and your Mearsheimer, right, what do neorealists tell us when there is a rising power? What do the other states do? Balance. Right? You balance or you bandwagon. Right? This is, is right, classic. Right, neorealism. Right, Ken Waltz, Mearsheimer. Right, but we have decided, nah. Right, we're going to do something different. Right, what we're going to do is we're going to split the difference between bandwagoning and balancing. Right, so we have chosen right a hybrid strategy. Right, called hedging. Right, so we take some elements of balancing and some elements of bandwagoning. So, right, so hedging is right, a mix or hybrid strategy right, between bandwagoning and balancing. So how is it a hybrid strategy? Right, so in terms of bandwagoning, right, what Singapore and, and again, right, a lot of, of Southeast Asian nations have done is to closely engage with China economically. Right? Bandwagon in terms of economics. Right? So China is now the largest basically trading partner of all ten ASEAN member states. Right? That is Right, the bandwagoning part. The balancing part comes from closely engaging the United States in security matters. Right, so that is, is the hedge. Right? You engage with China economically. Right? You benefit from, from trade with China. Right? But you hedge. Right? We have very close right, uh, defense ties with, with the US, right? and we'll see that. All right, so although 
right, China is Singapore's largest trading partner. All right, the United States is Singapore's largest source of foreign, foreign direct investment. Right, so American corporations right, invest heavily in, in, in Singapore, providing lots of, of, of jobs. Right, we also have a very close security cooperation with the United States. So we have um, Singapore Armed Forces right, training in, 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 in the US. We have F-16 uh, detachments training in, in Arizona, in, in, in Idaho. We have just signed a new agreement for the Air Force to, to train in Guam. There is an agreement Right, between Singapore and, and the United States where the US Navy has access to Changi Naval Base. Right? So the US Navy usually has uh, one literal combat ship right, coming through Singapore and also flies uh, P-8 sorties out of, of, of Changi. Right? But right, the relationship right, hasn't always been easy, right? So there is, is a, a photo of, of Singapore's founding prime minister, right, Lee Kuan Yew, and, and right, sort of in the 60s, right, sort of after independence, right, things really got off to a rocky start, right? So there was, there was an allegation that the CIA tried to bribe Prime Minister Lee, right, and, and right, when the, the, the Americans right, formally denied right, the allegation, Right, he published right, correspondence. Right. But again, right, one of the last things Lee Kuan Yew did before retirement was to sign that memorandum of, of, of understanding between the US and, and, and Singapore about uh, using the facilities at Changi Naval Base. Right, so the relationship right, has, ev has evolved right, from the U.S., uh, sorry, from, from, from America being right, suspicious, um, the U.S., uh, sorry, Singapore being suspicious of, of, of the U.S., right, to right, Singapore and, and the U.S. almost being right, sort of quasi-allies, right? There, there have been some reports, right, that Singapore was, was offered Right, official ally status, or at least major non-NATO um, ally status, but uh, Singapore chose right, not to, to take up that offer. Right. Singapore's relations with China right, have also been similarly complex. Right, so at, at, at independence in, in 1965, right, Singapore had no formal relations with the People's Republic of, of, of China. Right? There was a fear, right, given regional sensitivities, again, right, sort of in, this is, is Southeast Asia. So right, Singapore is the only ethnic Chinese majority country in the region. Right? So it, it, it is surrounded by, by right, countries that are Muslim majority. And so there was a fear that right, China, I'm sorry, Singapore would be viewed as a third China, right, after right, mainland China and right, the Republic of China, Taiwan. So, but, right, Lee Kuan Yew, I right, sort of began going to China in, in, in the early 1970s, right? So he, he met with Mao Zedong, right, Deng Xiaoping, and, and other Chinese leaders, right? And they started viewing, especially right, Deng after his, his reforms, started to view Singapore as a template for economic reforms. Right, as an example right, for, for China to adopt. Right? So when, when right, Deng Xiaoping visited Singapore in, in 1978, right, he called for China to learn from Singapore's experience. But it wasn't until 1992 right, when Deng Xiaoping made his famous southern tour right, to, to, to visit 
uh, Guangdong and, 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 and as such, that he said right, that China needed to learn from Singapore's, quote, good social discipline and order. All right, and then right, sort of China looked to, to Singapore for inspiration. Right? So since the 1990s, right, Singapore has actually trained over 50,000 Chinese officials and cadres right, in subjects ranging from urban management to social governance and public administration. Right? So that it, it is one of, of, of the things that keeps um, both countries engaged. So as uh, you know, so I said, right, China is, is Singapore's largest trading partner. And also, very interestingly enough, right, Singapore is China's largest source of FDI, right? Over 250 billion as of 2021, right? So Singapore's uh, FDI in, in China exceeds right, all other countries. But right, in this new great game, right, the space for hedging is shrinking. Right, as Singapore's Prime Minister likes to say, right, Singapore is, is, is a small country. Right, it is a price taker, not a price maker. Right, and as ASEAN comes under duress, right, as, as, as ASEAN right, finds it harder to navigate great power competition, right, Singapore finds it more difficult right, to navigate great power competition as well, right, because Singapore relies right, on ASEAN right, sort of to magnify right, its voice, right, to allow it to punch above its weight, so to speak. Okay, so we have sort of gone from right, the system level to the regional level to the state level, right? And before I completely bore all of you to tears, right, we'll look at, at some data about Singaporeans, right? What do they think about great power competition, right? And, and why this is, is uh, complicated for us. Okay, so. These data are from Pew's 2021 Global Attitudes Survey. Right? The, we've had the 2022 survey, but the data have not been publicly released. Right? So I've, I've extracted only the countries from the Asia Pacific. Right? And well, briefly, right, sort of the, the delta column is right, sort of the percentage favoring China minus Right, that of the US. So basically, if you see right, sort of negative numbers, they are sort of pro-American or at least anti-China. Right, sort of the positive numbers are pro-China, more in a, a, a pro-China direction. All right, so again, right, what we see, right, Singapore stands out right, among the countries as right, having a more favorable view of China relative to the United States. All right, sort of, there have been sort of disagreement about what this means, right, or, or the survey methodology. All right, one argument is that there is a selection bias in terms of Pew's selection of which countries to survey, right? So, right. Of these, right, Australia, Japan, South Korea are US treaty allies. Right? New Zealand is not a US treaty ally, but it is right, a close, close right, security partner of, of, of the United States. Right? It is part of, of the Five Eyes program. Right? And Taiwan used to be a treaty ally of, of, of the United States. Right? And the U.S. <laughs> remains de facto right, Taiwan's principal right, military protector, right? strategic ambiguity notwithstanding. Right? So there, there is an argument that although Singapore stands out here, right, in the 2022 survey, Malaysia was included, 
and Malaysia was much closer to Singapore again. Right? So there's an argument that if right, other countries, other non quote unquote Western countries were surveyed, right, Singapore wouldn't be the outlier. Right? So again, right, Singapore stands out in terms of, of right, the choice of economic engagement. Right? Again, the choice is here. Right? Is it more important for your country to have strong economic ties with China or the US? Right? Singapore picks, right? More Singaporeans pick China than they do uh, the US, right? which is again very different from um, the other Asian countries uh, that Pew surveyed. All right, when asked right, which should be prioritized, right, human rights or economic relations with China, right, here right, Singapore is, is again different from Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and, and Taiwan, Singapore, and, and, and South Korea, right, sort of are the outliers, right, privileging economic ties over um, human rights. <coughs> All right. There is also right, sort of differences, right? When Singaporeans are asked, right, how much confidence you have between Joe Biden and, and Xi Jinping, right? We hedge. <laughs> Right? We like both right? Joe Biden and, and Xi Jinping almost equally. Right? Again, right? whereas right, the, the other countries in, in, in the survey right, show a, a disproportionate uh, uh, bias in, in favor of, of preferring uh, Joe Biden over Xi Jinping. I have other I have other data that that, that, that digs deeper in, in, into this. All right, that shows that the differences, right, in the attitudes are primarily racial or ethnic. Right. So I've run the data. Right. Age doesn't matter. Education doesn't matter. Gender doesn't matter, right? But what matters is ethnicity, right? Ethnic Chinese respondents, right, prefer China over the U.S., right? So over the long term, it might be problematic, right? Domestically, right? For for several reasons, right? And and let's look at at, at some of them, right? So. How do we explain this? All right, one has to do with, again, right, this notion of, of Singapore as a third China, right, and cultural affinity. We have right, three quarters of the population are of ethnic Chinese descent. Right? Most of us are from right, southern China. Mandarin is, is an official language of, of Singapore. We have four official languages. English, Mandarin, Malay, and, and, and Tamil. Uh, many Singaporeans have visited China socially. Right? Many also have uh, extensive business and, and trading ties. Right? So this, in turn, may color some of, of right, the quote-unquote achievements right, that China has accomplished over the past 20 or 30 years. Right? The, the lifting of, of hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, right? the rise of, of China as an economic and military power is viewed right, favorably as an accomplishment. Right? So there's this right, sense of, of cultural affinity. There's a sense of cultural pride right, that the East is rising. Right? And there's also something that is probably sort of, you know, maybe uniquely Singapore, Singaporean in, in the sense that 
right? We view material success as worthy of approval. Again, right? This is the crazy rich Asian thing going on, right? Right? We see these things as 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 good. Right? Then there's also an argument that, right? Sort of. Politically, the population is, is primed towards pliancy with authority and pragmatism, right? So, long story short, right, we like our authoritarian figures, right? And, and this is, has probably um, the result of, right, six decades of, of uninterrupted rule by the government, right? The People's Action Party, right, which has been non-ideological, right? The emphasis has always been about pragmatism over principle, right? The pursuit of, of right, material success, right? And, and so, right, many Singaporeans, right, sort of buy into the argument that, right, human rights, democracy are not important, or at least less important than economic progress. All right, then, all right, perhaps more worryingly, there is worry about Chinese foreign influence. All right, so we have all right, large numbers of new Chinese immigrants all right, that, that have, have migrated to Singapore right, over the last decade or, or, or two, all right, sort of ver versus all right, the, the ethnic Chinese that have been in, in Singapore right, for maybe a, a hundred years or, or, or more, right? There are also, right, sort of again, these Singaporeans who have extensive right, business networks and right, economic ties in, in China. Right, sort of, yeah, right, so unsurprisingly, right, they would Right, oppose right, any antagonisms with China. Right, they're pragmatic. Right, so it doesn't mean that they support the CCP right, or approve, right, for instance, right, China's policies in, in Xinjiang. Right, I mean, right, at best, right, they would be apolitical. Right? Their goal is right, to seek profits. Right, there are also right, those Right, who view the U.S. as hypocrit hypocritical. Right, they, they, they disapprove of, of the U.S. and Europe right, for their quote-unquote excesses and failings. Right, and, and again, right, this is about right, the view of America's domestic failings. Polarization, right, gun violence economic problems, right? And, right, the lingering effects of America's invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. Right, and then finally, right, there is a segment, right, of Singaporeans who were Chinese educa educated, right, before the system Right, change, right, and, and I, I think there is right, some lingering sense of resentment in this group. Right, but they view right, sort of China's rise much more favorably compared right, to Singaporeans right, who are, broadly speaking, Western educated. Right, so when, when right, Singapore shut down the uh, Chinese vernacular schools in, in, in the 70s, right, they feel right, sort of aggrieved. Right? There was a sense of, of grievance right, about the rollback of, of right, the use of, of Chinese language and culture right? and a loss for them right, of opportunities right, compared to those that receive right, a, a, an English or Western education. All right, and I'll just end right, sort of with right, sort of again. Right, why is this important? Again, right, because 
we have our own history of ethnic tensions, right? Going back, right? So we, it's, it's still within, right? Living memory of, of right? Sort of racial riots in, 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 in the 1960s, right? And if, right, race and ethnicity is the principal cleavage, right, in attitudes towards, right, great power to competition, right, it might become problematic. And it is also problematic because, right, we have issues in dealing with disinformation and misinformation, right? Sort of, I see that, right, almost literally every day in my family chat group, right? Sort of, I have uncles and aunts, right, sort of sending me, you know, TikTok videos on, on, on everything from, like, you know, Ukraine to Russia. I'm like, okay, you guys need to get off, right, sort of the, the, the Chinese propaganda, right? But, right, the population is not educated on these problems, right? And the government's efforts have largely, right, been trying to deal with official, right, or state level efforts, more like subversion, right? But which is very different from, right, sort of the disinformation and the misinformation we see, right, via social media. All right, so I think I will end there and I welcome your questions and comments. Yes. Thank you for coming. Um, I did learn a lot. I feel like Singapore is often overlooked. So it was nice to hear about it. Um, so you had talked about four divisive issues, one of which, one of which was the coup in Myanmar. And I know in 2014, Thailand also had a coup. And in August, their prime minister who took over during the coup was suspended. But then it was ruled that he could stay in power. And I know Thailand also has had other problems, such as a youth-led um, protest on democracy. Um, the government extended had an extension that restricted freedom of expression. There's also been issues with torture and people disappearing. And then along the border of um, Malaysia, with Muslim, there's been an issue with that. And so my question is, how close is Thailand to being the fifth divisive issue? Do you see Thailand being a big problem? Thai for, for, for ASEAN? Yeah. Uh, no. Right, so sort of, I think the, the, the issues over Thailand have passed pass over, right? So in terms of ASEAN's quote unquote domestic issues, sort of an intra-ASEAN uh, matter, it is Myanmar. So, you know, the, the ministers again just met uh, over, over uh, Myanmar, right? Singapore's uh, foreign minister just again spoke about the Myanmar issue and, and how difficult it is going to be. So on Myanmar, right, ASEAN is, is receiving a lot of external pressure, right? especially the United States. But I think from ASEAN's point of view, right, they want to deal with this through ASEAN mechanisms. Right? So th th I think there is a, a need and a belief that if ASEAN is, is going to survive, right, ASEAN has to deal with this in an ASEAN manner. Right, and, and this is going to upset or disappoint external parties, right? Again, right, because this has to do with, right, sort of how ASEAN's decision making processes are structured. So there is now talk. Uh, again, right. So this is this is November first already. So uh, th there is a there is a handover to to Indonesia uh, for for the ASEAN chairmanship, right? And and one of the things you know Indonesia is is interested in in doing is bringing up that whole decision making process, right? To end consensus, right? That you know unanimity is is required to do everything, but the problem is, right? In order to to, to table consensus or unanimity, you need unanimity, right? So they, they, they're stuck in, in, in this circle. So 
the long story short is Myanmar is probably not going to be solved anytime soon. And, um, but from, I think, ASEAN's point of view, it is still better that happens, that it, ha it occurs within the ASEAN framework. Ago, the spokesperson of Foreign Affairs of China talks about that they are going to collaborate in close strength with the ISIS. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's 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 when right the the the, the two superpowers are, are are in zero co sum competition. Right, you know, the other side is very likely to to uh, to take advantage of, of of this. Right, but again. Right. The, the problem is, you know, we have documents like the National Security Strategy, the America's Indo-Pacific Strategy, and, you know, it talks about ASEAN centrality. But, you know, so th they say nice things about ASEAN and, and ASEAN centrality, but the U.S. then goes up, does something else, right? So, in, in I, I, again, back to, to the the trip I, I had last week in, in DC, right? So one of the things that we tried to convey right, to uh, my American colleagues is right, the countries are, are, are fearful, right? Especially as competition becomes increasingly zero sum, right? That ASEAN gets sidelined, notwithstanding, right? Sort of this ritual uh, incantation about ASEAN centrality, right? So if, if, if you read the, the national security strategy, right, it begins with ASEAN centrality, right? Then it starts listing court and AUKUS when, you know, these things are arguably incompatible, right? So it's, it's not surprising, right, then that, that, that China views this as an opening. But again, right, sort of China also has its own view of, of, of ASEAN and, and how it wants to engage Right with 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 ASEAN because I, I would also argue that right, China is probably not uh, favorable if in wanting a stronger ASEAN right especially when it has right can it's it's you know close countries like like Laos and and Cambodia right that would right, sow division within ASEAN. Great question, and and I actually answered that survey because the, that survey that, that you are referring to is like a, well, is what we call like an elite survey, right? So it's it's about it's surveying uh, experts in the region. So if you would ask the average person, right? So something like like you know a a, a Pew survey you would probably not get the same response, right? So you would probably not have a, a recognition of, of what the quad is, right? Or what AUKUS is, right? So, and to some extent, this is, is not very different from, you know, any other public, right? So, you know, if, if we look at, at public opinion surveys for, for other countries on, on foreign policy issues, <laughs> people don't really care. Um, but, if we look at it from, again, right, the, the, the elite uh, expert opinion, I think it depends on which aspect of the court we are looking at, right? So I, um, 
while there are sort of military aspects of the Quad, right, especially in terms of, of uh, coordinating naval exercises, right, engaging in, with, with India, like things like the, the Malabar exercise, I think arguably the most or, or what's, the, what's the, the choice of words? The Quad's most productive engagements, I, I would argue, have not been in the security domain, right? They have been in the non-traditional security domain, right? Sort of uh, vaccine, di vaccine diplomacy, for example, uh, pandemic management, right? And, and now the move right, to, to talk about climate change. Right, and and uh, climate security and energy security. So I think if 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 those are the emphases, right, then they become much more palatable to a lot of countries. And again, there are also you know stuff being done by the Quad countries individually. Right, Japan, right, Australia, India. They are not branded as the court because again, I think you know there, there there is recognition by these countries that there is sensitive regional sensitivities about the court, right? So you know they do things, but it's not branded as 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 the court. Um, great lecture, very clear. I have. Some questions, though, about definitions, right? Um, when we talk about Chinese foreign influence, it's not necessarily something that comes out of Beijing, because China itself has enormous cultural, subcultural differences, north and south, southeast, southwest. Um, and I think I, I would ask if some of the questions about Chinese influence on Singapore have to be um, qualified in light of Mandarin versus non-Mandarin speaking uh, arguments that took place, bitter arguments on, I, I've read. Uh, in Singapore, um, in the time span that you um, pointed to. Uh, so my question is, is China, is, are the Singaporeans investing in the Southeast China where, where they have most of their ties, historically? Or is it more broad? Um, and is that reflected in, in the opinions about what's going on in China? You know, Southeast China kind of led the big boom, right? And so basically, uh, an overseas Chinese were responsible for 70% of the FBI uh, from the Deng Xiaoping era on. So is it possible that those particular or peculiar ties, those uh, have skewed and, or heavily influenced uh, Singap Chinese Singaporeans' um, perceptions of China? Short answer, probably yes. Um, we, we don't have good empirical data to test Right, some some of some of your your uh, the points that you have brought up. So uh, first of all, you're you're right. So most of the FDI Singapore has has, has plowed into China remains right in the south, where where as as as, as you correctly pointed out, right, the vast majority of of um, Sing Singaporeans of, of Chinese ethnic descent came from. Right, so Guangdong, uh, Fujian, and, and 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 the like. So, again, you know, as as, as I pointed out, you know, there is that, that cultural affinity. I, I think that that drives, a, if not outright support for China, right, a a favorable view of of of, of China. But unfortunately, again, right, the, the last part of, of of my lecture is more conjectural, right? So the data itself do not allow us right, to test, especially for uh, Chinese information 
misinformation or, or possible Chinese disinformation uh, campaigns. So, but we, we see that especially a lot in, in, in social media, right? So, uh, um, again, again, this is anecdotally, right? Sort of just about every day, right? I have, you know, family members, you know, sending me um, videos, right? That I think too closely parrot, right? Sort of Russian propaganda on, on, on Ukraine. Uh, of course, you know, uh, back to your question about, you know, whether this is, is directed by Beijing, right, they will always, I think, have plausible deniability. If I, if I could press a little bit further, one of the factors that you indicated was ch new recent Chinese immigration. Um, given Singapore's adoption of Mandarin as its flavor of, of Chinese, are these Mandarin's uh, new Chinese coming in Mandarin speakers, or are they Southern Chinese who are comfortable outside, more comfortable outside, or as comfortable outside of the Mandarin bubble, if you want? Oh, okay, All right. So that is, they are not really outside the Chinese bubble. So one of the problems, again, right, as we have found in the last two decades, is right because. Right, they feel comfortable right, that Mandarin is, is one of our, our, our official languages, the, there is very little need to assimilate right, in, into right, sort of the largest Singaporean uh, culture because, again, I mean, they can just simply get by with speaking Mandarin and, and never having to, to, to speak uh, English right, or, or, you know, our <laughs> Singlish and, and or, you know, picking up, you know, uh, smatterings of, of Malay or, or, or whatever. So that was one of the key problems I think the government has, has, has found, right, is the lack of, of, if not assimilation, then lack of integration within uh, a, a Singapore's larger uh, society. Thank you. Sort of like Spanish in Miami, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're about uh, out of time, but uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ahead for giving us this, uh, this fascinating and enlightening lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.